thus invites me to call him Father. Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the Good morning. It's a beautiful day. Good, so good to see everybody here today. It's just a great day to come and, and to worship. Thank you for coming. And for those who are watching us this morning on Facebook Live, welcome. Thank you for inviting us to your home. Um, we're just excited that you've joined us in worship as well this morning. Uh, the Sunday school lesson 
that we had this morning will be available tonight at 6 p.m. So we hope you look forward to those who are on Facebook Live. We hope you look forward to reviewing our Sunday School lesson this morning. Uh, I will like to remind everyone about the, the, the preventions, the guidelines for safety and things we're doing here at, at Franklin to try to make us safer. You know, unfortunately, uh, we're hearing that uh, the COVID-19 counts are, are gaining momentum. We have more cases in Franklin, and so we just appreciate so much what you're doing. We appreciate you wearing a face mask. We encourage, we are encouraged that you're doing this um, as you're entering and, and exiting. I, I, I'm wearing mine during the service. I'm doing this uh, for your benefit. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that you all are safe. And so when I look out in the audience, when I'm delivering my message, if you have yours on, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate you thinking of others. And, and we're all doing the best we can with this. I'm, I'm even wearing mine during the singing. And you know what I think about singing. I enjoy it, but I'm just going to wear it. I believe uh, that we can do what we can to help stop the spread of this virus and so we appreciate what you all do as well thank you so much today we have a box on the outside if you'd like to help with uh, our thanksgiving food boxes you can put your money in the black box and then also today we're going to take up a, a contribution for everyone counts eli will talk more about this in just a few minutes when he has our opening prayer again thank you for coming we look forward to our worship service and we'll begin today with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a beautiful Lord's Day, for such a beautiful first day of the week you've given us to enjoy. And on this day, we're thankful for the opportunity to be able to come together here to worship thee Pray for you, dear Lord, to hear another portion from my word. And dear Father, we know we have so many blessings to be thankful for, too many to name one by one, but may we always remember the greatest blessing we have is our son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, who lived among men, set that perfect example that each one of us might pattern our own lives after. And then through no fault of his own, he suffered a cruel and inhumane death on that cross on Calvary, not for his sins, not for anything he'd done wrong, but for us, for all of mankind, that we might have the remission of sins, that we might have that hope of everlasting life beyond the grave, dear Father. May we not take that sacrifice for granted. And besides that, dear Lord, we do have material blessings of this world to be thankful for. We all have been truly blessed in the past. And we're truly blessed here today, dear Father, with current blessings. And we pray that we will realize that any blessings we have in the future, that all blessings come from thee, dear Lord. Blessings that we don't deserve, blessings that more than we need, sometimes blessings we don't even ask for, dear Father, but you give us anyway. And we're thankful for all the blessings that you give us. And Father, help us to pray for the upcoming presidential election Tuesday. We pray there's so many important things on the line for this election that the right man will become president and that whoever it is, their Lord, will keep this people of this country in mind that will work and serve the country. And dear Lord, we have a special request today. We want to pray for that China virus that's been going around this whole year, dear Lord, not only here locally, but throughout the world. There's been so many people that's sick, dear Lord. We pray for those that might be sick now, that they might recover, that they might have good health once again. And we certainly want to remember the many people throughout the world, because this has been a virus that's affected every country, everyone, dear Lord. And we pray for those families that, of someone that lost someone to the virus. Pray that you might comfort them and strengthen them as only you can do. We pray for those doctors, nurses, paramedics, all those people that are doing work trying to help those that are sick. Pray your, your safety, your health will be with, uh, with them, dear Lord. And we pray, dear Father, that somehow this virus will run its course or that perhaps a vaccine will be developed that will cure the vaccine, cure the virus there, Lord. But we ask for thy help, for there's only so much that mankind can do, only so much that mankind knows, dear Lord. 
We pray that they will do what they can, but we ask your blessings, your intervention upon this virus there, Lord, that somehow you will help us. And dear Lord, we pray for those that are spiritually sick, those that are outside of you, that they will come to know and accept you before it be everlasting too late. We pray that each one of us here might live our lives in such a way that not only we would have that home within heaven, but we might live in such a way that would be a good example of those that are lost, that they might come to you through us, dear Father. We want to pray for this congregation here at Franklin, pray for each individual, each family, each home who makes up this congregation because we all are an important part here in Franklin. And we pray that we all might do our part, dear Lord. We want to take this time to remember the fine women we have here among us, the wives, the mothers for home, the work they do at home and for the work they do here at this congregation. And we want to also pray for the children, young people here among our number, the children, young people throughout the world, dear Lord, that they might have the example they need so that they can grow up ready to take place in thy world, place of leadership in thy service, dear Lord. And we pray that us as men, husbands and fathers, we will set the good example for our home, that we will do our part. Dear Lord, we pray that sometimes we're weak, we stumble, we may even fall short, dear Lord. When we, that happens, we pray that you might strengthen us, that you might help us to grow strong once again, dear Father. And if we are strong, dear Lord, we pray that we will not be satisfied with what we're, where we're at, that we might continue to look forward to becoming ever stronger, dear Lord. And we pray that you will be with us as we go throughout the remainder of this day, throughout the remainder of our lives, however long that might be, dear Lord. Help us to realize that our days, our time on this earth is numbered, is limited, and someday we will stand before thee on judgment day. And we will, how we have lived our lives will determine where we spend eternity, dear Father. And we know that we thank thee for listening to this prayer today. We know you hear prayers and you do answer them, dear Lord. Sometimes you answer yes, sometimes you answer no, sometimes you answer soon, sometimes you answer later, dear Father. But help us to be patient, to know that the way you answer prayers is for our benefit, for our best, dear Lord, in accordance with thy will. And we thank thee for this avenue of prayer we have, that we're able to come to thee, make our wants and wishes known. Through the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's all sing out. We shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne, with humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion, unto the Lamb, unto the King, oh hallelujah. Sing the song of the redeemed. Before our communion. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, love from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. 
majesty. Worship his majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to take your bread this morning, we are thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, that he gave up his seat in heaven to walk with us as a man here on earth, that he was made a physical body to be beaten, to be broken on a cruel cross. We take of the bread this morning in remembrance of him. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to take of the fruit of the vine this morning, I'm reminded that you are an omniscient and an awesome God, and that from the, from the very beginning of time that you have had a plan set aside for your people. Father, and that you sent your Son to this world not to condemn it, but to save it, and that through him and the shedding of his blood. We take the fruit of the vine this morning in remembrance of his blood that flowed from the cross and the blood that saves us from our sins today. Amen. At this time, um, we have it set aside for our offering. Also, keep in mind this week as you give that we, it is an Everyone Counts Sunday, and that basket or that box is in the back, in the foyer back there. Uh, this month, the Everyone Counts money is going to the Caleb House family to help with his medical bills as he recovers from his surgery that he had. So just keep that in mind as you give. There you go. Um, but once again, that box is located in the foyer, and then, of course, we have our baskets for our contribution this week. If you would pray with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are a blessed people and a blessed church. I pray this morning that we might approach your throne with a generous heart and a giving heart. Father, I pray that as we give, we are mindful of those that have need this morning, that as a church that we can help to meet those needs. I pray that all things that we do are for your glory. Oh, this morning we, sp we pray a special prayer for the Caleb House family. Father, we pray that, that the funds given this morning may help to go to further his recovery, that he might be returned to the man, the husband and the father that he was once was before his surgery. Father, be with us, be with him, strengthen him, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'll be reading from the Word today from Revelations 3rd chapter, 15th and 16th verse. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. If you're comfortable, why don't we stand while we sing the next three songs. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a 
lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will not forget your love for me, and yet I'll forever be wandering. Jesus, be my guide, hold me to your side. I will love you to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. Keeping with Steve's lessons. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Please be seated. Thank you and good morning. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. I appreciate that song and appreciate our study on the character of Elijah this morning. Appreciate Jeff and the good job he did in leading our singing and Stanley with our prayer. Appreciate Rick reading from Revelation. We're going to visit that again in just a few minutes. I appreciate Eli and the work he does with us and especially this morning leading as we gathered around our table to renew our covenant relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What an awesome day we have to come and to worship. It's so good to see everybody here this morning. And if you have your Bible, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to begin there in just a few minutes. You know, if Fox or CNN, CBS, NBC, CNN, BC, ABC and all the others around the, you know, if they were covering the turn of events, the turn of events that happened around 700 BC, would they have included Elijah on their list? Or at least, you, you know, would, would, would they have summed up this event? 
that we're going to talk about today. You know, I wonder what they would have called this. I wonder if they'd given this a title. I wonder if, if they would have labeled this the Battle of the Gods, or would they have called this the greatest conflict of the century, or the God who answers by fire. I wonder what they would have called this today. But somewhere near the summit, of Mount Carmel. The prophet of God stood toe to toe with, with the prophets of Baal, calling down a dramatic fiery proof to see which one was the true and the only deity deserving of human worship and worthy of our obedience. So but, but before we come to this story today, let's review just a little bit. Let's talk about where we've been and how we got to this major event. If you recall, in chapter 17, verse 1, God sent Elijah, and he stood before Ahab, and he said, there's neither going to be new dew or rain for the next three years. And then God said, go hide. I want you to go to, to the brook at Zareth and hide there for a period of time. And then God tells him, when, when that period of time was over, to leave and go to Zarephath. And in both places that he went, uh, the purpose for him to be at both of these places what, was to know that God was going to provide for him, and he did at both places. You know, when he was sitting by, by the brook, God allowed him to be fed by ravens and enjoyed the water from that book, brook. And then when he was at Zarephath, he stayed in the home of a widow and her son, and, and her oil never ran out and she always had enough flour in, in her bin to prepare food for him every day so then months pass years pass the earth dried up and a ahab scoured israel looking for this guy he's looking for ahab the man of god but he couldn't be found and he was waiting trusting by faith that god would show him the next step so that's where we are today chapter 18 verse 1 now it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Finally after three years. After three years he says, You go and show. Now three years ago he said, You go and hide. But now he says, You go and show. I, I want you to be seen. I, we're ready. And he said, I'm going to send rain. So he does. And you know, the encounter between Elijah and Ahab must have been something to have seen. Must have been something to, to witness. Because uh, Elijah was the, he was the most wanted man in the country. And they couldn't find him. And so the famine was severe in verse 2. It was so severe in Samaria. It was tough. Now go with me all the way down to verse 17. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? He said, you know, when he, when he sees Elijah, can, can you just imagine? He's saying, boy, there's trouble here. I know this is, not, this is either going to be good or it's not. But there's trouble ahead. And so the noun form of the Hebrew verb that means to trouble, to bring calamity, is translated here in this verse, as troubler troubler it's also used in the hebrew language to describe a viper an asp or a snake so troubler is another way of saying is that you elijah you sorry snake in the grass <laughs> is that you i've been looking for you for a long time you've been causing me trouble for a long time Three years without a drop of rain in, in the entire land of Israel. Every brook had dried up. And can you imagine the walk that he had to take when he left that br the brook in Zarephath and he walked 100 miles to Zarephath? Can you imagine all the death and destruction that he had seen along the way in his walk? It would have to be horrible. Now in the midst of this terrible scene, here comes Elijah. And he's blamed for it. And he's saying, you troubler, you sneaky snake, <laughs> I know who you are. And think about the courage that it took for Elijah to go to Ahab. 
I mean, man, it took some awesome courage for him to go back, especially knowing that he's the most wanted man around. And he walks up on the scene, and, and he'd been trained. For three years, God had trained him to be able to do this. And he was not intimidated at all, not in the least. On the contrary, he had the courage to shift the blame back at him. And he says in, in verse 18, I have not made trouble for you, Israel. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. What he's basically saying is, don't you blame me. I'm not the troubler. I'm not the sneaky state, snake that you're calling me. God brought about this drought as punishment for you because of what you did. It hadn't rained. God has restrained the heavens because you've broken his commandments. He basically forgot the very first commandment. Thou shalt serve no other gods before me that we read about in Exodus chapter 20. And he needed to know that God of heaven is supreme. And Elijah is ready to prove it. And so now the showdown begins. Ahab, Ahab versus Elijah. Or actually, it was between idolatry and the living God. So what we see first here is a presentation for the proof. Elijah begins by offering a plan. A plan. Now let's read about that. Verse 19. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now Elijah not only rebukes the king of the land, but he also orders him to assemble all the prophets of Baal and Asherah, 850 total. And, and these guys, they've been sitting at the queen's table. You know, they didn't look like everybody else. They'd been eating well. They, they had, these prophets had plenty of water. They, they have been spoiled. They're welcome to the very core of the king. So look at verse 20. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. So he gathered everybody. And they basically consisted of two groups. The prophets and the priests of the false god, Baal and Asherah, the, the sons of Israel. A and then there, there was a representation of all the people. You know, some of the people were there. And, and Elijah. And now they're going to have a, a magnificent event together. But many Israelites had will, willingly followed their wicked and adulterous leadership. And Elijah just basically wanted to show them who the true and living God was. Look at verse 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. I think that, that phrase is so important for us to catch right there. Don't, don't let that slip by you because it's just so important for us to get. The people at this assembly said nothing. Nothing. They had already moved in the hardcore camp of idolatry. They weren't ready to say anything. And yet they, they were there. Some were divided. Some were indecisive. Some were following Asherah. Some were following Baal. Some were still thinking maybe about half-heartedly following, following God. And so he says, listen, how long will you remain lukewarm? How long will you hesitate? You can't have it both ways. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Get on one side or the other. It's decision-making time. And the people said nothing. Nothing. They didn't know what to do. Notice what he says next. Elijah said to him in verse 25, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Do you, do you see a little humor? In this somewhat, since there's so many of you, call on the name of your God 
But do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal answered us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar that they had made. Now the easiest thing for the folks to do at this hour of decision is to remain uncommitted. You know, if you raise your hand, somebody's going to notice, right? Well, which side are you on? No, nobody was doing that. They didn't say anything, right? They, they remained uncommitted, but not Elijah. He stood there alone. Everybody knew which side he was on. He was vastly outnumbered, but he was absolutely invincible when he was in God's hands. And so arrayed before him was idol-worshiping people, undecided people of the land that could say nothing. And no doubt there were idol shrines, uh, er, shrines erected there. If you look at the, the mountain, uh, Mount Carmel there, uh, th there was probably shrines in and around all over the place. Um, but he was God's man. He had a plan. And they would, they would be unable to ignore it or forget it. And if we can use the southern language and use the word fixing, he was fixing to blow them away. Fixing to blow them away. So, let's look at the presentation of the proof. I think Elijah's plan was ingenious. He was going to provide and prove that the Lord of God, the Lord God of heaven was one, of one true God. Look what he says in verse 22. Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophet left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. Then you will call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people spoke. What you say is good. I'm willing to do that. That sounds like a pretty good thing to me. They, they were confident in the God of Baal. It was shrewd, but it was fair. It was simple. Because when these people worshipped the God of Baal, they, they worshipped him as the fire of the, of the universe. He was the God of the sun, the all-controlling God of the crops, the all-controlling productivity of the land. And surely their God of Baal would have lightning to where he could send it down and start this fire, they thought. So they thought, this plan is good. We'll speak up now. I'll have the courage to say something now that I hear your plan. They said, this is a good idea. And so they did. In verse 26. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it at first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God. Do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal answered us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they made. They followed Elijah's plan. They did exactly what he told them to do, but nothing happened. They did this from morning to noon. They cried out, Oh, Baal, answer us. But nothing happened. The heavens were brass. There was no lightning, no fire, not a single stirring in the skies. No one answered. And can you imagine how deafening the silence was? You ever been in a room and all of a sudden it became silent? You remember how deafening that sound is? Imagine how it was there. They'd been shouting, they'd been dancing, they'd been calling, they'd been crying. And nothing happened. Nothing. So then they began leaping around the altar. They were jumping up and down in frenzy, crying out, begging, pleading, trying to get his attention, trying to make their God bring down fire. It must have been something to behold. And you know, if you don't think the Bible has any humor in it, I, I just see humor all the time and sometimes what I read, but observe what Elijah said. He said he began to taunt them. He began to make fun of them. He began to laugh and shout louder. 
Shout louder. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. He just went away on a small trip. He'll be back. Keep, keep shouting. Say it louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he needs to be awakened. Can't you just picture him standing off to the side somewhere, maybe leaning on a tree, maybe sitting on a rock and saying, hey, shout a little bit louder. You know, do what you can. Maybe you're not calling out loud enough. After all, he's a god. He's probably occupied, or maybe he's gone on a trip. And the Hebrew word that's translated here, occupied, suggests that Elijah meant that their god was in deep thought, perhaps preoccupied. You know, I've been accused, and I know you have before. Somebody in the room with you, they're talking, and, and you weren't really zoned in on what they were saying, and all of a sudden you hear, are you listening to me at all? <laughs> I mean, that's happened to us, hasn't it? Well, sure it has. Well, that's basically what Elijah was saying to them. Call him on him. He's not listening. Call a little louder. He's occupied. Yell, you guys. Meditating it not work, yell. Perhaps he's gone aside. And maybe your God's on a journey. Perhaps he's fallen asleep. You just need to yell louder where he can hear you. And what a, what a scene of chaos and madness. Can you imagine 850 people jumping up and down and yelling? Can you not see that? It, it, was, just, it, it was just a scene to behold. And it all comes from human bodies. But still nothing happened. Look at verse 28. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood, blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So now... Instead of morning to noon, now it went morning to evening. Still nothing. They mutilated their own body out of frenzy. There was no voice. These famous priests and prophets of Baal, who while the masses were suffering, they ate at the, the queen's table and were in fine shape, and now they had danced, they had yelled, they had cut themselves and bled to the point that they didn't have any energy left to call upon their God. And no one paid attention. And then Elijah steps into the scene. And this would be his moment of proof. This would be his finest hour. Everything that he had trained for. All the endurance of silence and solitude with God now paid off. And more importantly, it's God's moment of truth. Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to the, all the people, come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. He took twelve stones, one for each of the tribe descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water. And pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar. And even filled the trench. So the first thing he did, he rebuilt the altar. The altar to the true and living God. The altar which had been destroyed because they'd been worshiping idols. And if the true fire of heaven from the true God of heaven was to prove that Jehovah was the one true God, then an altar had to be built in the name of God. And he did it. And he used 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And he, he built this altar uniquely to the glory of God. And then he tells them to fill their pitchers with water. A translation you may have might say barrel, might use another term, but it was a significant amount of water. And you say, well, where did all this water come from? I don't know for sure. I do know that Mount Carmel is close to the sea, so they could have gone over to the ocean and got water and brought it. I, I don't know. 
I just believe what the word of God says. They had the water there and they, they poured it three times. And then look at verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet of Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. No yelling, no fits. He didn't cut himself. He didn't dance for hours. He gave a simple prayer. No empty repetition of the same words. Nothing. Just a simple prayer. And the contrast is stunning. The response was immediate. It was an all-consuming fire. It was convincing. Look at verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and it also licked up the water in the trench. Then all the people saw this, and they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. These people who were silent, they wouldn't say anything earlier. Now see this. He is Lord. God answered His prayer. He not only brought fire, but more important, He turned the hearts of the people back to Him. And he got rid of the prophets of Baal. Look what happened in verse 40. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had brought them down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. I think that's an unforgettable story. And one that we should reread from time to time. I think there are timeless truths that we can get from this for modern day Elijah's. I, I appreciate the song that we sang, These Are the Days of Elijah, for they are. And I think we can get truths from this story to help us live today. First of all, when we are sure that we are, we are in the will of God, we are invincible. We are invincible. Nothing makes us more uncertain and insecure than not being sure we're in the will of God. Nothing is more encouraging than knowing for sure that we are. Then no matter what the circumstances, no matter what happens, we can stand fast. You know, we can be unemployed, we can be without a job, but we're, if we're in the will of God, we can see through this. We can face life-threatening situations, but we know if we're in the will of God, even though the, the odds are stacked up against us sometimes, but if we are in the will of God, w we can make it. Nothing will intimidate us if we are in the will of God. And the equation, folks, is, is never 850 against 1. It's 850 against 1 plus God. It's always 1 plus God. We can, we can handle anything if we remember it's one plus God. And Elijah was never intimidated. In the passage of Scripture that we read this morning, Elijah gave eight commands. Every time he spoke was a command. He didn't shift. He didn't stutter. He didn't suggest. He leveled a command. He wasn't on the defense. He wasn't on the offense. He knew where he stood. And so the word to describe this is invincible. Invincible. And then number two, divided allegiance is as wrong as open idolatry. Elijah asked that question, how long will you be divided between two opinions? How long? And if you remember, the people were silent. And the easiest thing to do when we're outnumbered or, or overwhelmed is to be mediocre. Don't say a thing. Don't take any action. And that's where the people of Israel lived. 
But he never dwelt there. He said, you cannot continue in this period. You cannot continue in this period of divided allegiance any longer. You've got to make a decision. That's why I appreciate so much Rick reading to us a while ago from the book of Revelation. He, he, this is given to the church at Laodicea. And the reason this was given to that church is because their vision was unclear. Their reason was unclear. They were neither hot nor cold. And he says to them, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot or cold. I wish you were either one or the other because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold. I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. And so what Elijah is basically saying is get off the fence of indecision. Either you are for God or either you are against him. And perhaps you've known God for many years and you've never been truly committed to him. Perhaps you know about his son and you sit there living the life of mediocrity, knowing that you need to make a decision, knowing you need to be committed and how easily it is to sit there and do nothing. You know, let the word out. Speak your devotion today. Let your faith stand out. There's so many ways that God can use us. He can use us in our business, our profession, our school, our neighborhood. And if we don't agree with the things that's happening in this world today, please don't sit there in silence. These are the days of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord. And then third, our most effective tool is the power of faith. When he came down to the wire, when Baal had failed and God was about to do his work, one instrument that Elijah used was prayer. He simply prayed. And isn't it amazing how often we try to do everything else but pray. Elijah didn't pray last. He didn't try everything he could and then, oh, by the way, I'll just pray. He prayed first. He didn't use it as a last resort. So where are we in our prayer life? Do we personally pray? And I don't mean, do, do, we, do, do we pray to the with the people that come up here and lead us in prayer. I mean, do we personally pray? When's the last time we pray? Do we pray first? Elijah was a giant in his faith because he prayed. And then number four. Never underestimate the power of one totally dedicated life. This entire incident revolves around one dedicated life and that life of Elijah. He was a man all alone, overwhelmingly outnumbered by a hostile king, the king and his wicked wife, and 850 prophets of Baal. He was outnumbered. Yet all of those were silenced and intimidated because of his prayer. So ask yourself this morning, how many people have I influenced? people look at me and see the way that I live and have I influenced them for Jesus Christ? So think about that. Are we living our life in such a way that people can identify our Redeemer in us? Yeah. Elijah stayed a magnificent showdown with the prophets of Baal. But the greatest, the greatest showdown of all times was at Calvary where the enemy of God was defeated by the sacrifice of God's own son. Why? Because God had one dedicated life he could count on, and that was his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, this difference changed all of history. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Jeff, let's come sing. <coughs> Says I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou be as I am and waiting 
As we get ready to leave, that we do have our copies of the Pathfinder with all kinds of great information in there. So be sure and use those this week before we return again. We will close. Do we have any other announcements that need to be made? So good to have everyone here today. We're going to close with the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in him. bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we've had to be here this morning, to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to be at this congregation here in Franklin, and we thank you 
once again for that opportunity to be here to worship you, to sing songs of praises, to learn more about you. Heavenly Father, we come to the end of this service and we hope that and pray that we take the things that were said today, uh, that we apply them to our lives, that we will go out and, and touch others so that they might want to know more about you. And if I we ask you to be with all of those that are represented here today and their extended families, and we know there's a lot that are hurting out there that are, that are struggling today and will continue to do so um, in the trying times that we are in. There's been loss of life and um, just different things, tragedies that have happened to families, uh, losses of jobs and things of that nature. And um, we know that everybody is um, really struggling and, and we, we want to go out and, and, and help these people in some way, be of encouragement to them and, and to help them in any way that we possibly can. Heavenly Father, as we go to our homes and we go back to the workplace and we go back to our daily lives this week, uh, may we go out and, and show people Jesus and do everything that we can uh, so that people can see Jesus in us. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us always, you keep us safe, and most importantly, forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.